Hey everybody, it's Daniel, and welcome back to another episode of Spain to Go, the best podcast in the entire multiverse about Spain and Spain-related issues. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about Christmas. Of course, our favorite time of year around here at the Spain to Go headquarters. It's, um, you know, late December as I'm recording this. Got a Christmas tree sitting in my living room, and I've just published a list of Christmas-related words in Spanish and in English on my blog. You can go read that if you'd like to read along and uh, learn some Spanish. These are important even if you're not uh, intending to become a fully fluent Spanish speaker because you're just going to hear them all the time if you're around if you're around Spain at uh, the holidays. So let's learn, without any further ado, some Christmas vocab. You can read the words or you can watch a similar list of things um, on video if you go to expatmadrid.com forward slash Christmas. That is the short link to this list of vocab, expatmadrid.com slash Christmas. So, Christmas vocab. Let's start from the beginning. La Navidad is Christmas. La Navidad comes from a similar word as nativity in, uh, in English. From there, you could say Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad is Merry Christmas. You could also say Felices Fiestas if you wanted to for the holiday season in general. Felices fiestas. You could talk about Noche Buena. Noche Buena is the night of the 24th of December. This is, well, Christmas Eve, we would call it. Um, people get together in family and celebrate by having a big dinner on Noche Buena. Uh, they also celebrate El Día de Navidad, which is Christmas Day, the 25th of December. So Noche Buena is the evening of the 24th. El Día de Navidad is Christmas Day. After that, you could talk about Noche Vieja. Noche Vieja is the... it's old night. It is the 31st of December. It is New Year's Eve. Noche Vieja. I suppose because it's the last day of the year. It's the oldest day of the year or whatever. Noche Vieja. So that's New Year's Eve. After Noche Vieja, you have El Día del Año Nuevo, which is New Year's Day. El Día del Año Nuevo. Um, while you're talking about El Día del Año Nuevo, you also have Las Doce uvas. Bueno, that would actually be closer to Noche Vieja. Las doce uvas are 12 grapes that a lot of Spanish people eat. 12 green grapes that a lot of Spanish people eat. One for every ringing of the bell on, uh, you know, at midnight on Noche Vieja. So las doce uvas. Uva is a grape and doce is the number, of course. Um, I guess you could put the word campanadas there. Campanadas are the ringings of the bell. Each uh, bong, bong, each one of those is a campanada. So doce uvas para las doce campanadas. So after you have el día del año nuevo, you have noche de reyes. Noche de reyes Supposedly, in English, we call this the Twelfth Night, which for me is a play by Shakespeare that I have never read and never intend to. But uh, Noche de Reyes is the night of January 5th. I guess it's 12 days after Christmas or something like that, which is, or the Twelfth Night after Christmas, logically, would make more sense, which is why they celebrate. Because according to the uh, biblical legends or wherever they got this from the three kings of orient or three wise men um arrived in bethlehem to 
visit baby Jesus on the 12th night. Um, so yeah, that's Noche de Reyes. Reyes, Reyes for los tres Reyes Magos, who are the three wise men. Um, we have a song in English that is We Three Kings of Orient. I don't know. The three wise men, the three kings. There's different ways you can call them. You could call them the biblical magi also. I believe the official term might be something closer to the biblical magi. But yeah, they're, um, the literal translation would be the wizard kings or something like that. But that doesn't sound uh, very good. So los tres reyes magos who arrive on Noche de Reyes. After that, you have the 6th of January, which is Dia de Reyes, which is Epiphany, theoretically, in English. We did not celebrate Epiphany when I was growing up back in Arizona, so I don't know, but according to what I found, it is celebrated in some places, you know, some religious communities in the U.S. might celebrate it. I'm not sure if people in the U.K. do this. I know the U.K. has sort of Christmas and Boxing Day, but I don't have the impression that I've heard about um, Epiphany being a big deal there. And of course, there are other Orthodox communities out there where they might celebrate the 7th of January or, or the 9th or something like that. It depends. So anyway, here in Spain, it's the 6th of January, which is Epiphany. This is when the kids get to open all their presents and stuff like that. You could talk about Papa Noel. Papa Noel is Santa Claus. Papa Noel. Um, Noel. I don't know where, what we use the word Noel for in, uh, in English. I just got the impression that it's some Christmas-related word that is, you know, occasionally written down. Maybe it's, um, well, other languages probably use it more. But in Spanish, Papa Noel is... Father Christmas, I guess you could say, um, Santa Claus. After that, well, since we were talking about the Reyes Magos, we could talk about the gifts that the Reyes Magos brought to Jesucristo. Jesucristo is kind of the, uh, the short form of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus is a common name in Spain still, um, at least, you know. Yeah, definitely a common name. I've never figured out why in Spanish-speaking countries you can name your kid Jesus, but you would not want to name your kid Jesus in an English-speaking country. However, since we're talking about the three kings bringing things to the baby Jesus, el niño Jesus, we could talk about oro, incienso y mirra. Oro is gold, incienso is incense or frankincense, if you'd like, and mirra is myrrh. Myrrh, I have understood, is like kind of sap from some bush or tree that has a good smell. Not very common these days. I think you can get an essential oil online if you really need some mirra in your life, some myrrh in your life, but, you know... Um, I'm guessing it was a luxury good 2,000 years ago, and these days is not very common. You might see, you know, representations, visual representations of this in a nativity scene. A nativity scene is un Belén. Un Belén. Um, I guess I could mention that Belén is also the, it's a common Spanish name for women. And it's also the name of the town, I believe, where Jesus was born, uh, Bethlehem. So, Belen. We've got, finally, some typical foods that I could talk about, you know, foods that people might be eating around the holiday season. We have castañas, which are chestnuts. Chestnuts are really not very good. But we have this song in English that made it seem like they were a good idea. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. So you can actually find some people with little stands on a street corner where they're roasting chestnuts, you know, in wintertime. 
I think they were a big deal back in the day when people had uh, less money to eat better food. I've read a couple of novels about the post-war and people seem to be eating chestnuts for dinner with some regularity in those novels. But yeah, those are castañas and I don't recommend spending too much money on castañas. Get a couple and see if you like them before, um, you know, going nuts and buying a whole a whole box or whatever. After that, you could talk about turron. Turron apparently is nougat. Nougat, you know, God knows what nougat is. It's a thing made out of sugar or honey and egg whites and uh, almonds. There's a lot of different variations, though, so it can be hard, it can be soft. It can be, you know, watermelon-flavored. It can be caramel-flavored. It can just be plain. Lots of different things. But that's turron. It's a thing that you will see in all of your supermarkets around this time of year. I've even seen recently they're popping up all over. Well, all over. They're popping up in certain locations, sort of like gourmet turron shops, which I don't know. I don't think turron is that amazing, but maybe people just buy it because it's a typical Spanish thing they can take home to wherever. So yeah, turron is that. You've got also mantecados, mantecados and polvorones, which are just kind of these lard-based um, lard based cookies, which I also am not a huge fan of. You know, they're just sort of, they're sort of shortbread, I believe. Mantecados and polvorones. Polvo, I believe, because of the powdered sugar that one of these has on the outside of it, and mantecados comes from manteca, which is lard. So mantecados and polvorone, polvorones. After that, you have langostinos. Langostinos are prawns. Um, Spanish people love eating these for special occasions. They'll give it to you with the skin on and you have to peel it. It gets a little bit messy. Um, but yeah, langostinos. You could also just have marisco in general as a Christmas dinner, um, you know, shellfish. You could talk about jamón ibérico. This is another thing that people, you know, might eat any time, but you might spend more and get more of it at Christmas. It can be pretty expensive. Uh, Iberian ham, jamón ibérico. The Iberian pig is a special type of pig. Uh, it's a black pig that... I, I don't know, I don't want to say that it's only in Spain, but you know, it was originally bred in Spain. And this is what you use to make this ham. It's great. It can cost you kind of a lot of money. If you've got, you know, 120 euros per kilo type of budget, you can still just buy 100 grams and try it. It'll be 12 bucks, which is expensive. Uh, the usual ham that I get around here is I think you can get good ham for about 40 euros a kilo. You can get really good ham for about 80 euros a kilo, but you're never buying a kilo. You're just buying a little, you know, a little bit of it. And uh, for six or eight bucks, you can make one of the world's best sandwiches. So that's jamón ibérico. A typical thing that people in Madrid might have is besugo. Besugo is a type of fish called a sea bream. There's another type of bream which is called dorada. Dorada is maybe common all year round and besugo I only really see at Christmas. I think it's just the expensive cousin of the dorada. But yeah, um, I have no idea if you go around in the US and ask about their favorite type of bream. Probably nobody will know what you're talking about. But yeah, it's a kind of fish with sort of white meat and I don't know, not bad. Another thing people might eat at a Christmas dinner, cochinillo asado. Cochinillo is suckling pig. You can buy this. I mean, your supermarket certainly has it at this time of year. You can buy it um, like a half one or a whole one, and you can put it in the oven with some potatoes or whatever, or just salt water, and uh, roast yourself a suckling pig. Um, there's a famous restaurant in Madrid that has this, Sobrino de Botín. It's famous for being the oldest restaurant in the world. 
Um, and in the city of Segovia, I believe Segovia is famous for the cochinillo in general. So I've been to Segovia and just at a random restaurant for uh, about 12 bucks in the menu del dia, I've had a pretty good cochinillo. Um, in some places, it's just more common than others. In, you know, most of Spain, outside Segovia, you're probably not eating it every weekend, but you would maybe have one around Christmas. And uh, last thing for today, roscón de reyes. Roscón de reyes is the king cake. It's a cake in the form of a ring, usually with some sort of whipped cream inside and uh, pieces of candied fruit on top. And this is the cake that will, it will appear in all of your local bakeries about a week before Noche de Reyes. And um, yeah, it's uh, not spectacular, but it's a nice sort of tradition where a family will share the cake and, you know, it's a, it's a thing that people have been doing presumably for a long time. It's also not very common in the U.S., but apparently they do it around Mardi Gras in New Orleans, from what I've read. So, uh, yeah, Roscón de Reyes. If you're interested in the vocabulary, I'm not entirely certain, but there's other things called rosquillas, which are you know similar to donuts, but drier. I think we're just... Uh, when I hear the word roscón, all I'm imagining is some sort of round cake-like thing, possibly with a hole in the middle. So rosquilla is a donut, and roscón is a very large donut, essentially, is what we're talking about. So that's that. I uh, hope you have enjoyed this lesson. I'm not intending to teach Spanish all the time on this podcast, but if you're around at this time of year, if you're around Spain at this time of year, you'll definitely be hearing this vocabulary one way or another. So it would be good to learn some of it. If you would like more, you can just Google Learn Spanish with Daniel, and you will probably, not definitely, but probably find my channel over there on YouTube. It's a side project of a side project and uh, might be getting some more attention soon. But as usual, it's uh, tough to make money off of free YouTube videos, so I'm not doing too much over there yet. That could change at any time, though. So uh, check that out. Learn Spanish with Daniel. I've got a few videos about how to order a coffee, how to order wine, um, conjugations of some verbs, important expressions that you might like to know, things like that. It's fun. So uh, check that out and uh, subscribe to this podcast, wherever it is that you subscribe to podcasts, wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. If you have any ideas about things that you would like to see on the podcast, you could check out expatmadrid.com and find the contact form on there. Send me a message. I'd be happy to help out if I can. And uh, that's that. Hope you have a great day wherever you are in the world. From beautiful Barcelona, hasta la próxima. Bye.